As a brief introduction to um, Sarah's presentation uh, that we're going to launch into now, the Climate Solutions Caucus, uh, as I mentioned, is a group of about uh, 60 senators and state uh, state representatives. Um, uh, Do we have any Republican members? We have members of... We don't, but we've grown since, yeah, we've grown since a last lot. May, we've and grown. we are now up to 83. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> so, so 83 members. Um, we so have we've, an independents, we've got some independents, progressives, progressives and Democrats. And, Democrats. and um, Sarah is one of the co-chairs, uh, along with Senator Chris Pearson. Um, who is one of the senators that represents uh, Chittenden County in the legislature. And um, Sarah and Chris and others have done about a dozen of these presentations and uh, forums around the, around the state in the last month or so. I'm going to let Sarah speak to this a little bit, but um, I've heard from her, um, you know, just the different tone in the room, depending on where you are in the state and the different um, folks who kind of show up and are interested um, in these issues. Um, the, uh, the work that the Climate Solutions Caucus has done in the last three or four months um, was informed by a number of things. Certainly it was informed by uh, feedback we've gotten from actually some of the people in this room who I recognize well. Um, but not only from feedback from constituents, also work that the caucus has done in the last three or four months. Um, there's a number of work groups on transportation, thermal issues, renewable energy issues that um, they've been working on and um, a retreat that we had right after the session uh, ended to discuss these issues in detail. Some of the things that Sarah's going to talk about tonight are the kind of the culmination of that feedback from constituents as well as the, the, uh, the work that we've done since the last session ended. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I, I have been, as Tim said, I've been uh, doing a lot of these public engagement conversations around the state uh, from down in Arlington and Bennington area to Brattleboro area up to St. Johnsbury and we've also had um, Lamoille County and, uh, and Franklin County as well. Our goal as a Climate Solutions Caucus is really to get out and, and uh, talk with as many Vermonters who care about climate as possible so that we can enlist your support in passing uh, what we feel is a, a foundational set of, um, of bills that we would like to move in January. Um, and as Tim alluded to, you know, you get different conversations in different parts of the state. And so I can just give you a little spoiler alert that to some people, this is way too much, way too fast, way too hard, way too bold. And for other people, it is woefully inadequate and, um, and does not rise to the challenge of uh, the crisis that we are facing right now. So if you feel either of those two things, you're not alone. Uh, and we will have a chance for a little bit of um, uh, dialogue about these after the, after the presentation. Um, I want to uh, run through a few of the why am I here um, slides first. Um, and this should be obvious to any of you who, uh, who've been paying attention to Vermont's response to uh, the climate crisis because the yellow declining line that you see is the statutory goal that we have in place and the black line that's zigzagging and heading up like a, like a, a ski ramp there is our actual emissions. And so while we've had these statutory goals in place for uh, decades, we are, uh, we are not making progress. In fact, um, at best we're flatline and at worst we are, uh, our, our emissions are growing. Um, and so clearly what we've been doing is not working. Um, it's helpful to, uh, to just remind ourselves in the Vermont context that the majority of our emissions come from the black uh, swath at the bottom that is transportation emissions from 1990 to 2015. Um, and then just above that is the red is uh, home heating in case you can't see the um, see the key at the bottom of this. And so a lot of what we know we need to focus on is reducing emissions in, um, in heating and in transportation. So there's a real kind of nuts and bolts economic reason why, uh, why we need to be having this conversation. Uh, over and above the fact that um, we need to lead as states because we don't have a federal government that is leading right now on climate, um, is the fact that for Vermont's context, 
um, 78 cents of every dollar that we spend on um, gasoline or home heating oil or propane leaves the state every single year. So we are exporting um, the majority of the $2 billion that we spend as a state on heating and transportation. So to the extent that we can, um, number one, be more efficient uh, by, by uh, actively weatherizing more homes in Vermont, and number two, switch over to renewable energy that we produce here in Vermont, uh, we will be keeping more of that money in the Vermont economy, which means that more families have more money in their pockets and are not sending it right out of the state um, to go into the bank accounts of the fossil fuel corporations. Um, so the Climate Solutions Caucus, as Tim uh, mentioned, um, was dissatisfied with our lack of progress last year. And, um, and so the group decided that we really wanted to come together as soon as the legislature got done last year in May and figure out how to make sure that 2020 is not, um, th does not leave us feeling the same sense of disappointment. And so with an all-day retreat, we set up three policy working groups who, uh, who met um, either virtually or in person throughout the summer. Um, they took testimony from, uh, from professionals out in the field. They took testimony from average Vermonters. They engaged with, uh, with each other as legislators as well as with people from their own communities. And those three working groups were focused on transportation, uh, the green economy, and renewable energy as kind of a... Uh, all together, and um, building efficiency and weatherization. Um, and, and you see that that tracks very closely with what we know we need to do, which is to uh, reduce our emissions in transportation and thermal, uh, and uh, use more renewable electricity uh, to power our, um, our vehicles and our homes. So uh, the four bills that we, oh, well, before I get, before I dive into the four bills, those working groups um, met um, many times over the course of the summer, but we gave them a September deadline for coming back with recommendations because we knew that we wanted to get out and do this kind of public engagement. We can, we can, you know, make up the greatest, you know, solutions in the world, but if we haven't done any engagement to help Vermonters understand what it is, then there will be moneyed interests in the do nothing category who will trip us as we start out of the gate. So this is our attempt to make sure that we get out and engage with Vermonters. Um, and so far uh, we have had, you know, between 40 and 75 people at every one of these meetings that we've had, which really is very heartening to me to know that, uh, that Vermonters really do want to engage on these, on these issues. Um, but among the recommendations that came back from these working groups were about 30 pages of recommendations and ideas. And we wanted to make sure that we were putting forth the ideas that we know are foundational to what we can do uh, in the future, but are also attainable in a one year, uh, one session uh, legislative cycle. Um, we start in January. We're usually adjourned by the middle of May. So that really gives us a very short amount of time to get things done. And so as much as I would like this list to be longer and bigger and bolder and um, more aggressive, this is what we feel we can get done in 2020 with your help. Um, so transportation, building efficiency, energy and efficiency and accountability. So the transportation is the first um, big bill on the list. And um, you may have heard that there are um, 12 states plus the Di District of Columbia that are working right now to come together around what's called the Transportation and Climate Initiative. How many in this room have heard of REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas? Oh, you guys are so above average. I love this. Usually it's like, you know, maybe 5 or 10% of the crowd, and I just saw a lot of hands. So uh, if you know what REGI is, then, uh, then TCI won't be a mystery to you. It's basically a cap and invest system for transportation fuels. Um, it is not, there's, there's nothing boldly different about it than the, the Reggie program that Governor Jim Douglas uh, led Vermont uh, into uh, a dozen years ago. Uh, TCI will be a regional approach to help states cap their um, transportation emissions and then to invest in sustainable transportation um, technologies. 
So the proceeds, uh, we want to make sure when we do our enabling legislation for this program that the proceeds are focused on um, reducing emissions because the dirty little secret out there is that you could, if you wanted to, just use that money to pave uh, the roads and build new bridges. But that's not what's that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it, and we will make sure that we um, that we state this very clearly in our enabling legislation. The purpose of it is to reduce emissions, and so we want to make sure that it is investments in helping Vermonters access sustainable transportation uh, technologies. We also want to make sure that we move boldly to accelerate the investment impacts. And so, as a for instance, um, I have heard that Massachusetts has been kicking around the idea. Of, uh, of doing a bond uh, ahead of time. So, so TCI revenue, because of the agreement among these 13 jurisdictions, the TCI revenue will, will come in year after year after year. If you take some portion of that revenue and dedicate it to paying off a bond, you can front load some of those investments. And so if you take a diesel bus off the road tomorrow and you put an electric one in its place, you will get the emissions reductions tomorrow and next year and the year after and the year after. So that's the concept of, of looking to accelerate the investment impacts. <coughs> so um, the next category is uh, building efficiency. So um, there's, a, there's a dirty little secret out there and that is that um, Vermont's building codes, um, while they are followed when, uh, when, a, when a large project is done, a commercial building or, uh, or a large housing complex, um, the building codes are always followed because the engineers and the architects have a license on the line and they are required by the, the code of their license to follow, uh, follow a state's building codes. Um, but when you or I do a little work on our house or maybe we decide to build a new house, um, there, the dirty secret is there's nobody out there um, who's enforcing our building codes in Vermont. And so oftentimes uh, our homes are not built to the latest building science uh, in terms of uh, weatherization and in terms of efficient uh, heating sources. And uh, there's nothing um, that, that we have been able to figure out how to do that is helping to move that needle. <coughs> So we know as a Climate Solutions Caucus that, that that huge swath of emissions come from our buildings and the, the you know, 100 year lifespan of a building means that if we don't start holding new construction to those standards soon, we are going to have a 100 year problem on our hands. Um, so we need to find a home in state government for uh, an entity who will at least inform people um, you and I as homeowners as well as the contractors that we might uh, you know hire to come and do work on our house we need to make sure that people are at least informed of what the best practice is and what the standard is and right now uh, there we don't have a mechanism to do that and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to use the um, the state licensure program that we have so right now there are thousands of people who go out into your homes every day who are licensed by the Secretary of State's office. Um, it, so those would be um, realtors or real estate appraisers or HVAC installers or plumbers or electricians. All of those people have a state license. We'd like to make sure that when they re-up their license that they are getting some information and being, uh, being informed so that they are part of the um, part of the solution here as we look to them as professionals to help us make decisions about our house. Uh, an anecdote that I have heard over and over again is, you know, when you go to uh, replace an old oil heating system, it's really difficult to get somebody to come in who's going to show you the broad range of all of your options. Oftentimes what you get is somebody who just wants to put in another oil boiler. They don't necessarily know how to talk to you about an advanced wood heating system or a, a, an air source heat pump. And we want to make sure that all of the professionals who help us with our homes uh, are aware of and, um, and helping to inform Vermonters about their options. Uh, we also want to make sure that we make efficiency measurable, right? So, 
So that's why you want the realtors and the appraisers to be on board with this because if you have solar panels on the roof of your house right now, I understand that real estate appraisers don't really know how to value that. Uh, if you've just put money into weatherizing your home, that's a great investment. It's a great investment for anybody who's coming to buy your home because that means that your home is going to be cheaper to maintain than, than a similarly uh, priced house down the road. But we don't measure that right now. And so we want to make sure that we're uh, using our, all the tools that we have to measure the efficiency that we're putting into our homes. Um, and making sure that aligning workforce with climate also, um, also extends to uh, car salespeople, right? If you walk onto a car lot and you know you want an EV or a hybrid vehicle, it's really hard to get the car salesperson to show you the electric vehicle. If they have one on the lot, it's like way in the back of the lot and it's not something that they're, uh, that they're pushing. It's not something that they're prioritizing in, uh, in many cases. And so we need to find a way to, uh, to, to ask our sales force to prioritize those vehicles. Um, so if we do what we need to do in terms of transitioning to sustainable um, energy for transportation and for home heating, uh, we will, along the way, um, need more electricity. And we want to make sure that we are sourcing that electricity from clean, in-state, renewable generation. Okay? It's, it's all well and good to rely on offshore wind or, as many of us do right now, um, hydro Quebec. But as we need more energy, we need to make sure that it is sourced here in Vermont because then we get the added benefit of uh, job creation here in the state. And it will also improve our... Um, our energy independence over time as we're renew uh, uh, doing more renewables here in state. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, how are we going to do that? We need to make sure that we're streamlining uh, the incentives for, uh, for, for electric generation in state. And um, along the way, we can also take a look at speeding up the transition to our all fuels efficiency model. So. Since you all knew what Reggie was, I'm sure I'm going to get almost 100% of people who know what Efficiency Vermont is. <laughs> yes, okay, that's nearly 100%. Yes. Um, so Efficiency Vermont has been our electric efficiency utility for a long time, and it has a very good um, track record in helping Vermonters save money on their electricity bills. But if you had you know, 50 or $60 million a year to invest in efficiency right now, you might not only concentrate on electricity efficiency, you might ask them to concentrate on all fuels efficiency so that we can enlist this uh, trusted name, this trusted entity who's been in Vermont helping Vermonters uh, for a long time to help us with, um, with our uh, fossil fuel utility um, decreases as well. And so that, in fact, is a process that is underway right now, um, and we would like to think about pushing it along and moving it faster for this coming <coughs> legislative session as opposed to waiting until 2021 for that uh, process to play its way out. Um, so, a little spoiler alert, we may put that on the jumpstart mode. Okay, so the fourth uh, of our banner priorities this year is really about accountability. And the graph on the right will look familiar to you um, when you saw it at the beginning of the presentation. The dotted line was yellow and the ski jump was black. So that is Vermont's statutory goals again and Vermont's actual emissions. And I want to contrast that with actual emissions in Massachusetts. And that's what the blue line is in the middle. And you can see that Massachusetts and Vermont track very closely to each other for the first half of that. Um, uh, of that time span and then Massachusetts takes a dive down now why did they do that well about a decade ago they passed a global warming solutions act which took their aspirational um, greenhouse gas reduction goals and put them into statute as requirements that's what we're talking about doing and uh, we are talking about doing that 
not just looking at the way Massachusetts put their law into place a decade ago, but actually looking at New York and Maine, who passed their greenhouse gas um, targets last, uh, last legislative session, so in 2019. And so we want to take a look at what Massachusetts, or excuse me, what Maine and New York have done as a model to see, um, to see what we think a Vermont version of this looks like. Um, and also because it, it makes sense for there to be continuity across the region, right? If we're all in this together, um, we should all be working in similar ways. So the, the Global Warming Solutions Act, if you looked at what was introduced last year, um, I, I have a feeling that what we see this year will look very different uh, because of the fact that New York and Maine just passed their versions of the bill. Um, so everything that you hated about last year's bill, I'm sure, will be gone. <laughs> um, so this is really a strategy, though, to turn um, all parts of state government into focusing on greenhouse gas uh, reductions. And uh, if we have every state agency focused on that, it will demand that the governor and the legislature have to come together to figure out how to make those happen. And the good thing is, you all know your state legislators, so when that hard work uh, has to happen, you know who you will call and say, okay, how's this going to be done, and, and how do you think this is going to work, and, and that back and forth, this back and forth dialogue that we are having here tonight will continue through the course of the next several years. Um, this is foundational to future action, uh, because this, uh, this accountability includes the, a mechanism for a private right of action for you as Vermonters to say to your state government, you're not doing what you promised to do. And that's why this is so fundamental to what we need to do in future years. Because right now, if it's too hard to figure out how to, to reduce our emissions, we just have been not reducing our emissions, right? You saw the ski slope. It's, uh, you know, our emissions are shooting up. If you want accountability, we need to pass this bill. And this is going to be hard. Um, and and I, I won't deny that, uh, that this is going to be a challenge. But uh, luckily, we have Chair Briglin on the job. I understand that his committee is, uh, is going to go first on, uh, on this bill. And then, of course, if the House passes it, it will go over to the Senate committee um, to, to be worked on as well. So, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later on in this presentation. Um, so the other things that I wanted to point out to you, because many people around the state have said, yeah, but what about the red words across the top? What about resiliency? Okay, We know that our communities are going to be seeing um, more and more violent storms, more freeze-thaw that pops the asphalt off the road, um, you know, more inundation with, uh, with flooding. So we know we need to be focused on resiliency, and in fact, there's a working group that started its work this fall, uh, Randall Zott, who is uh, the rep from, is he from Barnard? Barnard, Barnard Mumford, West Hartford. Yeah. So uh, Randall Zott is the, one of the co-chairs of that group. Uh, Carl Demereau from Corinth is the other co-chair of that group. And they're going to continue meeting through, um, through the, the holidays and into January to, to help us to frame up what we want to move forward for priorities to really help our communities uh, improve their resilience, whether it's infrastructure resilience or <coughs> agricultural resilience or just you know human beings coming to each other's aid you know, when, when the next big storm happens. Um, equity. Um, it is foundational to what we believe that we want to make sure that the climate solutions that we put forward work just as well in West Fairley as they do in Williston, as they do in Wyndham. Okay? And that means that we need to be looking at equity in terms of uh, recognizing that uh, people who are low income pay a much higher percentage of their uh, their family's budget on their heating and on their transportation because they live in some of our draftiest housing stock and because it is more expensive to live closer to the economic hubs and so low-income people who are working service sector jobs often have the, the longest commute. We know as we are designing solutions that we need to be focused on equity. 
Uh, but we also need to be focused on climate justice because if you remember who the people were who were hit hardest when Tropical Storm Irene hit, it was the low-income people who lived in housing stock right near the rivers. They got washed out and, you know, sadly in many cases some of them have never recovered uh, financially, emotionally, um, logistically from, uh, from the disruption of their lives. And so uh, as we're looking at what the next 20 years bring, we know we need to be focused on, uh, on our low-income neighbors. I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to invite um, Tim to, to be the facilitator for Q&A.